I will say uh, of all the Psalms that we have done, and we, we've been in this for a year now, uh, this is the most complex one. Um, it is called an imprecatory psalm, uh, and an imprecatory psalm is where the psalmist cries out for vengeance on his enemies. Uh, it is not an easy one to, to, to dive into, but when you do expositional preaching, meaning you go from you know, verse to verse, chapter to chapter, you can't skip the hard things. Uh, and, and we're going to dive into one of these hard things because we need to understand how to think about this because it pertains to us in our day. Uh, so this is, uh, um, if this chapter was like a, a swimming pool, this is not the shallow end. Uh, so join me as we, as we dive in uh, to this great, great book uh, and understand the heart of the psalmist uh, who lived in a very turbulent time. Uh, and his turbulent times translates to our times and how to function in those times. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, submit ourselves to the, the scriptures. They are the word from uh, you to us. Uh, there is no other word. There is no other God other than you. Thank you that you are perfect in your being, that you're a balance between holiness, uh, justice, uh, righteousness, anger towards sin, mercy, love, and all of those things. Uh, there's no one greater than the other. There's a balance in your character. Uh, forgive us when we don't understand the depth of who you are and help us to understand that character in this passage as it is brought to bear uh, by the psalmist. And help us to walk away with principles as we live uh, in a culture that does not embrace you, a world that is adrift. Uh, might we be all that you called us to be uh, to, to those who don't know the Christ and don't know your word in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, from the founding, uh, uh, and that's going to take me a few minutes, by the way, to, to get to the text. So if you're new this morning, I'm just telling you up front. So we'll event I, don't, I don't meander. Uh, we're, we'll eventually get to Psalm 137. So if you wonder why we're going through this history lesson, you're going to understand it when we actually get to Psalm 137. So what Psalm are we studying? Yes, you keep that in mind. We'll get there in a few minutes. Uh, uh, from the founding of the kingdom uh, in 1051 BC under the leadership of King Saul, uh, it took 465 years uh, for Israel to go from a, a place of great prominence and power as a nation to oblivion. Uh, we know that the, northern, the kingdom split in two in 930 BC under taxation. Uh, imagine that one. Uh, was Rehoboam's son uh, anteed up and said, you think my dad taxed you a lot? Wait till you see me in action. Uh, caused the kingdom to split in 930 BC. Uh, eventually, in, uh, the 10 tribes that went north lost their part of the kingdom because they didn't obey the prophets they didn't obey God, uh, and they lost their kingdom to the Assyrians under uh, Tiglath-Pileser in 722 B.C. Uh, it took another couple hundred years uh, for Judah in the south uh, to fall. But boy, they did fall. But it took 465 years. Uh, I want to go through how they fell, because that, that relates directly to Psalm 137. Uh, how they fell uh, was in three deportations. Three kings who did not know what they were doing brought the nation into captivity. King number one is uh, King Jehoiakim. He reigned from uh, 609 B.C. to 598 B.C. Um, he banked for his national security, not on God, but on Egypt to his south. So Israel was sandwiched in between all the major players of the day, the Babylonians uh, to their, their east, uh, and the Egyptians to the south. So whenever those two major players wanted to attack each other, whose land did they march through? Little old Israel. And so King Jehoiakim was the king over Judah uh, for those years. Uh, and in 605 BC, the uh, Babylonians engaged the Egyptian army at the Battle of Carchemish, 605 BC. Babylonians won that battle. Uh, and later in that year, 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, uh, entered uh, the land of Israel uh, and sought to bring his former, the former vassals uh, that were related to Egypt under his control, people like Judah. Uh, and... Uh, that is when he started having problems with uh, Jehoiakim. Uh, eventually at this time, this was the first deportation, uh, 605 BC. Uh, that's when he took the intelligentsia from the nation, the cream of the crop, the young people with the brightest minds, like Daniel. They were hauled off into captivity, 600 miles away from home, uh, over into Babylon. It's where, they, where men, young men like him were raised. Uh, in 601 BC, the Babylonians once again engaged the Egyptians. Uh, and that particular battle, uh, resulted in a, a militaristic stalemate. Uh, Jehoiakim, thinking that was an opportune time to uh, rebel against his uh, Babylonian masters, uh, again appealed not to God. Woe to the nation, by the way, that doesn't appeal to God. Did not appeal to God, he appealed to the Egyptians. Uh, that didn't bode well for him. Uh, in 598 BC, uh, the Babylonians marched uh, and subdued the unwilling king, uh, removed him, and, and, and hauled him off to Babylon. 
eventually, according to Jeremiah chapter 22, 19, was brought back to Israel where he died. Uh, in the place of Je King Jehoiakim, uh, they, they brought his into, in, in, to, to be the new king. Babylonians appointed his 18-year-old son as king. Who would want a leader at 18 years old? They have so much wisdom, don't they? Um, and so uh, his 18-year-old son, Jehoiachin, not Jehoiakim, and when you're studying the kings, don't you wish they all had names that weren't sim similar in endings? So King, uh, king Jehoiachin became the king, but he only reigned for three months. His crime? Uh, he, too, revolted against the Babylonians. They then marched on him, uh, and they, they took control of his city. And at that time, according to 2 Kings chapter 24, um, they took 10,000 slaves with them uh, over to Babylon, uh, along with 7,000 soldiers that they, that they captured. They even, according to Ezekiel chapter 1, hauled Ezekiel the prophet off into captivity, and they took many of the treasures that were related to the temple. Uh, that was the second deportation, the demise of the nation. Uh, the third deportation occurred under the next king, King Zedekiah, Israel's last king, Judah's last king. Uh, he was placed uh, on the throne of power by the Babylonians to be their puppet, to do their bidding behind the king. So they had a king of the line of Judah who was supposed to lead the nation, but he was really uh, the, uh, ruled by the puppet masters in, in Babylon. Uh, he did not... Uh, bode well during his ruinous 11-year reign. Very unwise man. Um, the, the, uh, if you look at what happened to him when he rebelled against the, the Babylonian uh, leadership, uh, when he, he again turned to the Egyptians for help under a pharaoh, Hophra, uh, and again the Babylonians pounced on him. You'd think they would learn, wouldn't you? Uh, they kept turning to Egypt, and, and God let the Babylonians judge him. And he did the same thing, turned to Egypt, and, and the Babylonians judged him. They laid siege to the city in 588 B.C. Uh, on July 16th, 586 B.C., uh, the uh, Babylonians broke through the, the outer wall of Jerusalem. They eventually captured the city. Uh, they took uh, Zedekiah north uh, of Damascus up to Riblah, uh, where Nebuchadnezzar had his base of operations. Uh, and they brought all of his sons before him and executed them. And I'll, and I'll explain to you why we have to talk about that on a Sunday morning when we get to this psalm. Remember what psalm are we in? 137. They executed his sons. That's the last thing he saw because then they put his eyes out. These guys were ruthless. Underline ruthless. No Geneva Convention. Four weeks after the defeat of Jerusalem on August 16th, 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar sent uh, his commander of his imperial army Nebuzaradan, uh, to uh, Jerusalem with one goal in mind, level it. Anything that's beautiful, steal it. And anything that's magnificent, destroy it and burn it. He's the guy that burned everything to the ground, including the temple. Who can imagine what it must have felt like if you were a Jew and you watched that? Invasion of your nation, three times, your political leaders making decisions that they absolutely should not logically make, and it cost you your nation. Uh, they lost their nation, and Psalm 137 talks about like what happened after they did. But when you look at the invasion of the land and the fall of the nation um, that leads to the writing of this great psalm, uh, you have to understand that the fall of the nation didn't happen in a vacuum, because for 465 years, God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to warn them, obey the Lord, follow the law of God, uh, uh, and it will bode well with you. And for the most part, the nation threw God to the wind, disregarded the law, and did whatever they wanted to do. So if you go through uh, the, the prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets, and the only difference between a major and a minor prophet is how big their book is. So Obadiah is one chapter, uh, as opposed to, well, Isaiah, it's 66 chapters. But if you go through the prophets, which I did this week, and just kind of uh, cherry-picked out some of the reasons why the nation fell, I'll just give you some of the reasons why the nation fell. Uh, number one, according to Jeremiah chapter 12, too, the people spoke spiritual truth, but they didn't live it. They went to church, but the minute they walked out of the door, it didn't mean anything. Uh, according to Micah 2, verse 1, the people lived for devising new ways to sin. Sound familiar? Uh, Micah chapter 2, verse 2, many used violence as a mean to steal land from other people. Uh, Micah 3, 1 and 2, leaders didn't lead with justice, but they took advantage of people uh, through the courts, and they failed to tell the truth as leaders. Uh, Micah chapter 3, verse 5, the people loved and embraced all false teaching over true teaching. And God help you if you, like Jeremiah, spoke truth, 
you were the one castigated. Micah chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, the people love to hear false and positive messaging, not truth and sobering reality. Do you come here because I'm going to give you a positive message? Thanks, thanks a lot for encouraging me. Um, no, you come here to hear what? Truth. Truth. Truth is a balance between that which is positive, which you need to hear to be built up, and that which is negative, to, the Spirit of God uses that to wake you up from sin to call you to holiness. That is my calling, so I personally am not here to please people. I have to please Christ. And when I answer to him one day, it's me and him toe-to-toe, for he's going to want to know, did you teach the word like the prophets? That is my calling. Uh, Zephaniah uh, lays out the reasons that the nation fell in chapter 3, and it's a great summary for the whole reason why the nation fell. And remember, we're still going to what Psalm? 137. Zephaniah says in chapter 3, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the tyrannical city. She heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. She did not trust in the Lord. She did not draw near to her God. Her princes, like her politicians, were roaring lions. Her judges are wolves at the evening. The whole judicial system was corrupt. They leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets, what kind of men are they? They are reckless and treacherous men. Her priests, how are they? Well, they, they profaned the sanctuary. They've done violence to the law. The law is righteous. The Lord is righteous within her. He, he will do no injustice. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He does not fail, but the ju- unjust knows no shame. I have cut off the nations. Their corner towers are in ruins. I've made their streets desolate with no one passing by. Their cities are laid waste without a man and without an inhabitant, and you brought this on yourselves. But it didn't have to be that way. God's telling them, you should have listened to the prophets and loved me with all your heart, soul, and mind, your neighbor as yourself, and I would have blessed you greatly. And God warned them for how many centuries? Over 400 years, he warned them. So don't tell me that God is not, right, not, not loving and he's not kind and he's not tolerant. He's all those things. He kept warning them for 465 years and eventually he said there's a price to pay for sin. Uh, how about our nation? Uh, Chuck Colson wrote a book uh, years ago that I read. Uh, he spoke actually uh, in 1980 when I graduated from college from Azusa Pacific University in LA. Uh, he spoke to our graduating class. He impacted me as a young man. I was 18. Uh, he wrote a book called Against the Night years ago, back in the 80s. And again, in that book, in the first chapter, he makes a statement. It was kind of a haunting statement that has stuck with me through my 30s, my 40s, my 50s, and now my 60s. Because he analyzes our culture and basically says, where are we going if you connect all the dots? This is back in the 80s. And he, he says this, based on what he ana- analyzes in our culture. Times seem to smell of sunset. When I look at my culture today as a godly man, it looks like the sunset. It's, it's an ominous time because people are doing all the things that Israel did that cost them the nation. And I would be remiss in my job as a pastor and not calling if, I'd, if I did not give you an offer of warning uh, to wake up and pay attention uh, to God who's almighty and holy and calls people at all times to worship him and him only. And he's loving and kind. He will bring mercy and blessing to the nation that turns to him, to the people that turn to him. But to those who disregard truth, disregard law, uh, God brings ultimate judgment. So when you think about all of these things, uh, what happens when the unthinkable happens to your life and really to your nation? This Psalm 137 is a national psalm of lament, a precatory psalm, where he pours out his heart for God to help him work through the emotion of losing their nation. He's going to answer this question that I think about all the time as a godly man, uh, as I live in this country as an ambassador of Christ, uh, I think about this, and here's, here's the main motif from this passage. Psalm 137 answers this question. How should you, and I'm speaking to Christians, how should you as a Christian respond to national calamity? I mean, what should your response be? Hang it up, call it a day? Uh, no, he's going to express how you should respond to a, a calamitous time in a nation by giving you three concepts uh, through three movements of this great song. Psalm uh, 137 tells you, uh, number one, In a time of national calamity, uh, as you, as the psalmist, watch his nation being led into captivity, um, he tells us this, uh, verses 1 and following. Notice what he says. He talks about his pain. He says, by the rivers of Babylon, which would be the Euphrates and the Tigris, and if you can't remember that, just remember the the movie E.T., E.T., okay? 
by the rivers of Babylon. Uh, there we as a nation sat down and we did what? We cried. Why were they crying? We remembered Zion, which is a code word for Jerusalem. We, from there, our captors, uh, oh, up on the willows, uh, in the midst of it, we hung our harps. We took our guitars and we hung them on the branches. It's not time for singing anymore. It says, therefore, there our captors demanded us of our song and our tormentors mirth, saying, quote, hey, why don't you Jews uh, sing some songs of Zion to us now? Uh, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? This is, this is amazing stuff. It's emotional stuff, isn't it? Now you're going to begin to see why we spend so much time talking about the history. For three deportations, they had watched their land looted, friends killed, the whole land destroyed, and now they are hauled off uh, 550, 600 miles to Babylon. Uh, many of them walked there while the Babylonian soldiers rode horses, uh, and no telling how many died along the way. And then when they finally get there and they're still holding on to their harp, they finally realize as they watch the waters go by, this ain't time for singing. This is a time for sadness. Because what God told us was going to happen has happened. Uh, when you sit by a river like the Potomac, if you ever go up to Great Falls, my son used to work there uh, uh, when he had a job there at the park. So we'd go up there and, and look at the rivers. Sometimes we'd go at night. Sometimes we'd go when the park was closed because of snow. Uh, and we would go, and we'd be the only ones there with Nathan and watching the water go by in the moonlight. And this, Isn't it beautiful? I mean, our river is a place where you sit down for reflection and enjoyment, but not when your nation fell. You get next to the river, and you're thinking, this is a time for reflection and enjoyment. And they're like, well, no, we can't sing because we, we lost Jerusalem. What had they lost? Well, they had lost the enjoyment of the River Jordan. I've sat by the River Jordan many times at all different places. I've been on the River Jordan up in the north in the Golan Heights. I've been in the River Jordan down by the Dead Sea, seen it, all of its beauty. They had lost the, the, the main access to their river. They're not, they're not going to see that again. They had lost the wonder of the Sea of Galilee. When you, when you sit by the Sea of Galilee, as I've done many times, sitting on a rock, reading my Bible early in the morning before I take my group out, and you just sit and reflect, and you look at Tiberius off in the distance, the city on the hill, Jesus is talking about that. And you, you can just see Jesus and the disciples there. They lost the beauty of Galilee. Uh, they lost the wonder of the Dead Sea. Who doesn't want to walk into water that's like 16% saltier than the ocean? And you walk in and you think there's a current and it starts picking your body up, but there's no current. It's just, it's that buoyant. And you, you can pour yourself into a little ball and just stretch out and float for miles with no effort. And you walk out of there and it's supposed to rejuvenate your skin and make you look younger. But every time I've ever been there and watched people come out that are really old, it's not improving things. I can just say it. I actually pointed that out to my friends one day as one person got it. I'm like, I don't think it's working. They lost the wonder of the Dead Sea. It's wonderful down there. They lost their cities where they had so many memories built over generations, hundreds of generations of memories. And they lost the temple, the place where they worshiped the living God, where God spoke to them, where the cloud came down and filled the temple. They lost the access to the well, the altar where they could offer sacrifice to cover their sins. They lost all of that. No wonder they sat there and they took their harps and said, can't sing today. When you think about their captors, uh, captors taunting them, um, you can just, in, their, in your mind's eye, uh, you know, think that a, that a captor could mock them by saying, hey, why don't you Jews sing, uh, you know, from your worship psalter, why don't you sing Psalm 2 for us right now? Psalm 2, verse 9, about the Messiah. Thou, the Messiah, shalt break them, the godless, with a rod of iron. Thou, the Messiah, shalt shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, this is the Messiah, lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Couldn't you imagine them taunting them with that song? Hey, why don't you sing that one about your missioch? Your anointed one. Where is he? Thought he was going to break us like a clay pot. Seems like we broke you like a clay pot. Can you imagine them sitting there and thinking, well, I can't sing that one? Uh, put it in our perspective. Suppose we lost the nation, which we have not, but suppose we lost this nation and we were hauled into captivity and your captors came to you as we're sitting next to a river and said to you, hey, why don't you sing that God bless America theme to us right now? Who would want to? You know the song? How hard would it be to sing, God bless America, the land that I love? Stand beside her and guide her through the night in the light from above. 
From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam, God bless America. It's my, it's my home. And we lost it. Imagine the emotion. What do we learn from all this? Uh, what do we learn pragmatically from their pain as they shared it next to the Euphrates? Uh, that at a time of national calamity, uh, there is a time for expressing your pain. That it's okay to express your pain. Now, I know we have a military church. Uh, a lot of people are trained uh, to, to deal with pain. I totally understand that. Uh, and some people are really good at expressing their pain. They're more emotionally based, correct? I mean, tears come easier. It's easier for them to express their feelings. For some of our people, it's harder for them to express their feelings. But a time of national com- com- calamity, what does God want to hear from you? He wants your heart. He wants to hear what's in your heart, what you see, what you experience, and he wants you to articulate to them, to him what you're feeling. And, and if you're having a hard time doing that, just ask God to help you. God, with what I see, how do I put it in words? The evil that I see as it advances. How, 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 do, I, how do I say to you, Lord, what's on my heart? Uh, and we know from Romans 8 that when you pray, the Holy Spirit comes in and helps you anyway. He takes your groanings and he interprets them to the Father. But, but say, God, Lord, Lord, help me to express the pain that I see. And there is pain to see if you're paying attention. When you express your pain to God, uh, one of the advantages is uh, you don't move into depression. Because if you don't express your pain and you keep that pain inside of you, it will lead to depression and darkness. But when you take that pain and you lay it at the feet of Jesus, uh, Jesus promises you to give you peace. Matthew 11, what did Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are, what? Weary, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, I am humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's come to me. And there's, some, there's times when I feel like the evil that I see around me advancing, and I as a godly man, it, it, it disturbs me. And I know I must be a light to the godlessness about me. But I look to the Lord and I say, Lord, but, but I, I lay my burdens at your feet. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. See, that's what the psalmist is doing from an Old Testament perspective. He's saying, God, this pain is too great. I, I got to get it out. Do you? Do you do that? And when you do that, you will find this. The Lord will come to you and say, here, let me take that burden off your shoulders and give you shalom, peace that you need. Number two. When the calamitous things happen to a nation, you should be one who vows to be loyal. You vow to be loyal. Verses five to six. He says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill, my tongue may it cleave to my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my my chief joy. See, Jerusalem was the center of the nation. This is where the temple was. This is where God came down and filled the temple when it was dedicated by Solomon. First Kings chapter eight says uh, about that particular event. Verse 10, And it came about when the priest came from the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. And then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a thick cloud. I have surely built thee a lofty house, a place for thy dwelling forever. So God came down, shielded us from his Shekinah glory with a cloud bank and said, I will dwell specifically there for you to see me. Uh, That was Jerusalem. Uh, From that place, from that temple, is where uh, God's presence not only was in a powerful way, in a visible way, in the cloud bank, but this is where his law was, in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, and the law. This is where the law was taught by the priests to the people. And they had lost all that. And this man says, you know, no matter if I'm hauled off to uh, Babylon in captivity, I will vow, Lord, I will never forget the core of my faith, Jerusalem. I will not forget. Uh, how could they forget Jerusalem? The, the place where God spoke truth to mankind. H- how could they forget that? He says, I will not do that. He says to God, basically in his vow, uh, I will never throw in the spiritual towel no matter how dark my day is. Uh, I will never give up no matter the progress of the wicked. They've hauled us off into captivity. They beat us. I still believe that you're the king of kings and you're going to come and establish your kingdom. I, will, I vow to hang on to that. He says, I will never exchange truth for a lie. I never will. I vow to be a godly man in a godless time. This is sound advice for, for me and for you as Christians, is it not? That as we watch national calamity happen, it's not just in our nation. I mean, it's around the world as prophesied. As you watch these things, this is the core of this passage, that you express your pain to God but then you turn around and say, God, no matter what happens, you can count on me. 
I vow to be the man who stands in the gap. See, you should be the person who doesn't just share your emotional feeling, but you tell God, uh, now is the time for me to have a spiritual spine, to be courageous, to be brave. This is the time that you tell God, the culture might go off the proverbial cliff, and I think they already cleared the cliff. But I'm not going with them. I will call them to holiness. I will call them to the gospel of Christ. See, my culture might want me to embrace lies of the culture so I fit in, but I will say I will, I will embrace no lies of my culture. I will embrace the truth of the word of God. I will be that person that speaks truth and love to those who don't know it. My, my culture pushes and, and tries to shape me into their, their sinful mold. But this man says, even sitting in Babylon, Lord, I will hang on to all that my faith means to me. You have to ask yourself, is that you? What does our culture need? Christians at calamitous times who express their pain to God, knowing he will hear them. And number two, Christians who will stand up and say, Lord, you can count on me. I will stand in the gap. I will speak truth. I will live truth. May that be your vow when you walk out of this place today. It's my vow. It's my vow. Lastly, verses seven and nine are highly problematic. Because here he says you should look backward at the atrocities committed, but also look forward. There's a balance. Notice what he says. Verse seven. Remember, O Lord, and, and the, the Hebrew word, uh, by the way, to remember, zakar, means to remember with action. So remember, O Lord, against the, the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, the Edomites to the south of us, said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation, level Jerusalem. He says, God, would you please remember the Edomites, what they said? And O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one, how blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us, how blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rocks. You see why this is hard? He's praying for what we would call lex talionis, ju justice. He's, he's praying for the, the, the justice based on the, the standard of God, that what they did, it would come back up on them. And I'm gonna make a couple points about this. And then he ends, I mean, he ends on verse nine. I mean, talk about a, a difficult way to end a passage. But that's where the Spirit of God ends this. And it's most instructive for us. Because from this, he tells us to look back at what has happened in honesty, but also look forward in what is God is going to do. So I'm going to point out three things. Number one, if you look at what he says there and you find it problematic, it is. But remember these three things. Number one, uh, this was an emotional time for the psalmist. I mean, think about it. He had probably watched the Babylonians do what he is writing about. So don't judge a person who has watched atrocities committed if you weren't standing there in his sandals, as it were, to see what he saw, to witness and hear what he heard. Uh, he's writing from an emotional base. Uh, and I find it very difficult to judge a person who's watched the things that he saw. Number two, be honest. We all say things that are off the grid when we watch atrocities. It's just a human condition. It just comes out of the heart when you see atrocities committed. Uh, this was a two and a half year siege against his nation. Uh, according to Lamentations chapter two, if you wanna read what happened in, in, the, in the siege, um, there was no food, no food, to the point where cannibalism kicked in. And I won't go into the details, but you can read the chapter yourself. They had no food and they had to resort to that, imagine, getting to that level. Josephus talks about this. If you want to read Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, book number 10, chapter 8. Read it, and you will see what was committed. When you read about the atrocities, you'll understand the emotion of this man praying for justice, justice. Third, the psalmist was, from his perspective, really looking forward prophetically to the time when God would judge the godless. He's not saying, Lord, give me the opportunity to be the point of your vengeance. He's not saying that. He's saying, God, you be the one that brings justice because your justice will be true justice. Uh, if you study the Old Testament, I have two degrees in the Old Testament, so I've read it a couple times. Um, and what I've read is most interesting because when you read Obadiah, Obadiah uh, prophesying from uh, 855 to 841 BC, he prophesies the fall of Edom, the Edomites, their brother. Remember Jacob and Esau? Esau, the father of the Edomites. This is their brother, how painful it is for a friend and a brother, a family member to turn on you. 
See, as they, if they fled south from the Babylonian army, when they fled south, they ran into the Edomites. Their brother turned them over to the Babylonians. Obadiah prophesied uh, 855 to 841 BC. So this is some 300 years before it actually happened. He prayed for God to judge the Edomites for their pride. And God eventually did. If you study history, God did judge the Edomites. Uh, he judged them uh, in 312 BC when the Nabataeans overtook their cities. They were also uh, routed during a Judas Maccabeus in 164 BC. They were judged by God. So that prophecy of Obadiah, Obadiah was true. That, this psalmist had to know Obadiah's prophecy because he was probably a priest who was in the temple who taught. He would have also known the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah uh, who prophesied some three centuries before the fall of the nation. Um, Isaiah 13, the whole chapter, chapter 14, the whole chapter, chapter 21, Jeremiah 50, chapter 51. I mean, many of the prophets spoke of the fall of Edom and the fall of Babylon. Edom fell as prophesied with specificity, and Babylon fell exactly as prophesied. The only uh, caveat is, uh, as, as we will study tonight when we study Revelation 17 uh, at, uh, at our study of the book of Revelation at 630, if you'd like to come, uh, we talk about the final fall of Babylon. It, it will finally fall as prophesied. But what is the psalmist saying? He's saying, God, the prophets have foretold the fall of these hostile nations. Might you bring that and bring that so where we can see justice reign? See, it's looking back at what has happened, looking forward to what's going to happen when the king comes. Paul did this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Listen to Paul. It says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay, this is lex talionis, with affliction those who afflict you, to give relief to you who are afflicted, to us who dwell when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. What's he going to do when he shows up? dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. All these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among who all those who believe, for our testimony to you is to, believe, to be believed. Paul says, I as a Jew, I can look back you know, at the things that have committed that are, that are terrible, but I look forward to the king is coming. And because the king is coming, that gives me great hope in the future. But that doesn't mean that you just sit by and do nothing until the king comes, correct? No, when the king is in abeyance, when he's not here yet, we have our marching orders uh, in many places in the New Testament. I would say Matthew 5 through 7 is a good place to start. Blessed are the, if you don't know, the meek, the peacemakers. I mean, start there. Be there. Uh, how about where Jesus talks about you, you're a light that's set on a hill. Don't let your light be hid under a bushel. In a time of great darkness, I'm to be a light to my culture, right? I'm supposed to be salt to the decaying meat around me, to call them to holiness and repentance, to come to know the living God. I'm supposed to be the salt. Are all those things easy to do? No. Uh, will you be the most famous person in the room? No. Will everyone like you? No. But I would rather be loved by God uh, because I live for him. Uh, and, and God needs courageous people. Today's a day of a vow. God, you can count on me. You can count on me. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for not giving us always easy things to hear, not always simple things, uh, but we know this is from you because had this been written by man, they would not have included this psalm. So we thank you for the power of this psalm. It speaks from the heart, it speaks great truth, and it calls us to obedience as your saints we do live in dark days, but we are so grateful we have the gospel of Christ to showcase to the world. May it be clearly seen in how we live and how we speak. And may our culture be impacted. May we live to see the revival of the Spirit of God on our land in a profound fashion. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.